Good afternoon, this is Mark. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I align my Minimax CU300 Classic uh, table saw. In particular, we're gonna level the table and align the slider, cross-cut fence and rip-cut fence. There's seven basic steps that I follow. The first one is to get a general level of the machine to, to the floor. So we don't want things rolling off of it. It's not a perfect level, but I want the machine roughly level. Second step will be to make sure that the cast iron top of the saw is planar. We don't want any twists in it, so if one side is a little low, the cast will actually twist and we'll be in trouble. The third step is to look for any sag. Um, there could be sag in the middle of the table. In this particular machine, the motor hangs off, the saw blade motor hangs off the cast iron top and pulls down on that cast top. So it's to expect that over time that would sag and there's, there's a little rod that we can use to help eliminate some of that sag. Um, the next step is gonna to be to get the slider aligned relative to the cast top. So I've got, now I've got a flat cast top, doesn't have any twist, doesn't have any sag. We're gonna align the slider just a few thousandths of an inch above that cast top and make sure that it stays there through the whole travel. Um, this is particularly important when you use the shaper. You can't have the shaper, the slider moving up and down as it passes the shaper. If you do something like the groove on the side of the board, the groove will be moving up and down the board. So the slider alignment is important for the saw, but it's critical for the shaper operation. Um, the next step is to set the slider so that it runs parallel to the saw blade. Um, we don't want the wood being pushed into the saw blade as it slides and it's okay if it, it toes out a little bit, if it slides out a little bit, but I'm gonna shoot for parallel or the smallest amount of toe out on the slider. Um, the next step is to align the cross cut fence so that we get nice 90 degree cuts and the last step will be to align the rip fence. So let's get started and, and do the process. The tools we're gonna to use in this process is a construction level that we'll use to just get a general level on the table a six millimeter hex wrench, and we're gonna use that to adjust the cross cut fence and to loosen up part of the slider. Uh, there's a little support beam that needs to be removed from the equation so that we can level the slider. Some automotive feeler gauge and a precision straight edge that we'll use to make sure that the top doesn't have any sag in it. A precision level that's going to help us with the really nitty gritty of making sure that there's no twist on the table, on the cast iron table. We'll also use this when it's time to align the slider so that it rides above the cast iron table. So, really handy device. This particular one has an adjustment on it so that I can put it on my table and adjust it so that it reads level. And then when I move it over to the slider or to the other end of the table, I know what that reference point was and I can level everything to my initial reference point. So, it's, that adjustable feature is kind of handy and uh, it's adjusted with this uh, posi screwdriver. And the only other tools we need are a couple of 17 millimeter wrenches, and that's just for the bolts that pull the slider in place. There'll be five bolts on the slider that we need. So, so let's get at it. So the first step in the process is to get a general level of the machine, and with that I use the large construction grade level and kind of prop up the corners of the machine. For this particular leveling, I used shims of plywood, hardwood, some thin slivers of pine, some pieces of paper wedged in pieces of plywood, I'm trying to get enough accuracy. I'm trying to get this thing, the twist out to within a, a few thousandths of an inch. It took a little finagling, but we finally got it level. Although I used shims to level the machine, it appears there are four nuts tack welded into each corner of the machine. So it appears possible you could use leveling feet after cleaning off the coating from these tacked on nuts. Now that we have a general level accomplished on the machine, the next step is to finally level the cast iron top, making sure there's no twist in it. For that process, we're going to use a machinist level, a lot of patience, and some more shims. The machinist level includes a small screw that lets us adjust the relative level where the bubble is positioned. So first we set the level on one end of the machine and adjust the screw until the level reads level. Now we move the machinist level to the other end of the machine 
and we can see how much relative tilt there is from one end to the other. We next use shims to adjust the feet of the machine until both sides read the same. Now we know that there's no twist in the table. Now that we've leveled the machine and eliminated any twist in top, we're going to look for any sag in the top. The sag would probably be caused by the weight of the motor, which is hanging off roughly the front third of the cast iron top. We make this adjustment with a threaded rod, which is located inside the saw cabinet. Well, let's look at what the result is of leveling that cast iron. The actual bolt that comes up underneath the cast to push it up is located right here. So it's about midway between the spindle shaper and the saw motor. Uh, maybe a little closer to the spindle. And all you're able to do is lift that up or lower it and, and let it sag over time. I suspect it'll, it will take some time to equalize. I started off with a one hundredth of an inch dip here one two thousandth of an inch feeler gauge. So we've got about two thousandth of a gap. The front half of the saw blade, front third of the saw blade, and the back half of the scoring blade. Let's see if three thousandths will fit in there. There's no user adjustment that I'm aware of that will let me fix the depression here. 3,000th is too big. So that's it, we got 2,000th of an inch um, in this span here, and the rest of it's dead flat. Now that we've leveled the table and removed any twist and sag, it's time to adjust the slider to ride slightly above the cast iron tabletop. This alignment is particularly critical right in front of the shaper. The height of the slider at the shaper spindle has to be consistent through the entire throw of the slider. Although probably not necessary, I removed the aluminum throw plate around the main saw blade and a second plate in front of the shaper. This makes sure I don't bump into these things with the precision level during the leveling process. Next, we'll level the rail that the slider rides upon using five bolts. There's two at each end and one in the middle that deals with sag. There's also a brace at the end of the rail that holds the extension on the infeed side. I'm going to loosen this completely just so that it doesn't affect the leveling of the slider, and then I'll tighten it back up when we're all finished. The handle of the locking knob for the spindle shaper gets in the way of turning the wrenches when you level the slider, so you may find it useful to remove this locking knob. Be careful. Oh, shit. It's a long rod with a washer on the end of it, and the washer won't pull out through the cabinet, so you have to loosen it, pull it back a couple inches, reach inside, remove the washer, and then pull the rod the rest of the way out. The next step is to level the slider using the five adjusting bolts. I plan on spending several hours in this process, moving the slider through its entire throw, checking the height above the cast iron table at multiple places. You may be lucky getting it done quickly, but I spent several hours making small adjustments. One adjust affects the other one, so it's a round robin fashion, and then we move the slider up and down through its throw and check and double check and back and forth and back and forth until you're happy with the results. If you get burnout, take a break. Come back tomorrow. You'll be pleased that you did. One quick note on leveling the slider. Having a level with an adjustable bubble was extremely helpful for this process. When I initially set up the slider, I spent several days and never got it close, not really understanding what the problems were. The adjustable level let me really hone in on making sure that there was no twist in the cast table and then getting the slider itself set up great. I used a 12 inch Shars precision level that I purchased from the company directly for a little under $100, including shipping. Now that the cast iron top is level and the slider rides parallel to it, a few thousands of an inch above, it's time to set the toe out of the slider. Toe out describes the relationship between the slider and the blade. If it toes out, the slider moves slightly away from the blade through its travel. Toe in is the slider moving slightly into the blade. I'm going to set the saw up so it's relatively neutral, that is, the slider runs parallel to the blade. 
Rather than using measuring devices to measure the toe out, I'm just going to cut a piece of MDF. MDF is particularly good for this use because of its smooth surface. It's very easy to see and feel the cut of the back teeth on the MDF surface. In addition to examining the cut surface, we can also use our eyes and ears. As the MDF is pushed through the blade, you'll likely hear the back teeth when they start to cut the wood if your toe out's not neutral. You also may see sawdust flipping up in the air from either the left side or the right side of the blade. It can be helpful to use your ears and listen to the rear of the blade as it enters the workpiece, even when you're in the middle of the project. This will help let you know if there's been an adjustment knocked out of whack. So we're going to cut through the wood and stop when the front edge of the saw exits the MDF. Then we can note where the teeth at the rear of the blade stop and they're cut through the MDF. If the teeth on the back side of the blade leave a mark on the left side of the cut, then you've got a toe-in situation. If those back teeth leave a mark on the right side of the cut, then the board's moving away from the blade or you have a toe out. If you can't tell the difference between the back teeth and the front teeth cut, then you're dead parallel to the blade. To adjust the toe out requires loosening the bolts that hold the slider rail in place. We just spend so much time adjusting those bolts that we don't want to mess up the alignment. What I did is very carefully loosen the bolts all exactly the same amount, about 1 16th of a turn, and then nudge the slider to either make it toe out or toe in, whatever adjustment was required at that point in time. About a little bit of a bump on the right which I would expect if it's towed out a little bit. Oh, we're calling it good, man. Yeah. Now that the table is level and the slider's been adjusted, particularly the toe out has been adjusted, it's time to set up the crosscut fence. The crosscut fence attaches to the outrigger. The outrigger can be positioned anywhere along the slider. I'll show two examples where it's at the outfeed side of the slider and the infeed side of the slider. The stops on the top of the crosscut fence allow you to make very accurate crosscuts. However, this requires adjusting the crosscut fence and its distance from the blade. This is accomplished with a stop that's on the bottom of the crosscut fence. When you reapply the crosscut fence, you slide the fence until it hits the stop, ensuring accurate, repeatable distances from the blade. The pivot pin that hits the stop can be mounted on either side of the stop. There's advantages to both. If the pivot pin is closer to the blade, this allows you to slide the crosscut fence away from the blade without removing it. You just loosen the two locking nuts underneath and slide the fence and re-tighten them. This is really helpful if you're ripping a long board on the slider, you can easily slide the crosscut fence out of the way, lock down the slider, and treat this like a conventional cabinet saw. The advantage of having the pin on the outside of this stop is that you can move the fence closer to the blade. This is helpful for shaper operations and for miters. Although the five-sided cut method is very popular for aligning table saws, we're going to use the three-sided cut method. I learned this method from Sam Blasco's excellent YouTube video. Very briefly, what we do is find a long piece of plywood, four or five feet long, maybe three foot wide, cut a reference edge down the three foot side, put it up against the cross cut fence and cut the long five foot side. Now flip the plywood over, keeping the reference edge against the cross cut fence and cut the other long side. If the plywood is exactly the same width at both ends, then the cross cut fence is square. There are two screws on the outrigger for this adjustment. One controls the angle of the crosscut fence when it's on the outfeed side of the outrigger. The other one controls the angle of the crosscut fence when it's on the infeed side. There's one caveat when adjusting the crosscut fence. The little locking knob on the bottom of the crosscut fence bumps up against the screws that we use to adjust the angle. However, this collar is a little bit wobbly. So if you push it hard against the outrigger, you'll get a slightly different angle than if you push it gently against the outrigger. So you need to come up with a consistent way of applying pressure and tightening that thing down so that you can resume the same position that you had before you remove the fence. I've put little pencil reference lines on the outrigger to show me where the fence is on both sides of the fence. And this allows me to make sure that I reassume the exact same position of the fence when I remove it. 
The final step in our alignment process is to align the rip fence parallel to the blade. Since our crosscut fence is already aligned perpendicular to the blade, and when we have a nice big sheet of plywood that has square corners on it, we're going to slide the piece of plywood up against the crosscut fence and slide it over so that it's in the rip fence area. No cutting is required for this process. We just place the rip fence up against the sheet of plywood. Adjustments to the rip fence angle are made using a little bolt that's on the rail that holds the rip fence. If you'd like a little toe out on the rip fence, which is common, you can use a feeler gauge between the plywood and the rip fence and adjust the rip fence with a small amount of toe out away from the blade. Although adding a small amount of toe out to a rip fence is common on a cabinet saw, it's probably less important on a sliding table saw with an adjustable fence. Toe out is used to prevent kickback where a board might expand as it's being cut and jam between the blade and the fence. With an adjustable fence, we can just slide the fence forward so that the back edge of the fence is even with the front of the blade. That way there's no way for the board to bind between the blade and the fence. Finally, we can fine tune the toe out of the rip fence using the same technique that we used to fine tune the toe out of the slider. I learned this method online from a gentleman named David Coombe. What we do is cut a piece of MDF against the rip fence and stop as the edge of the board reaches the front of the blade. Now mark where the back teeth stopped in the cut and examine both sides of the cut to determine if the rip fence is towed in or towed out. That's all there is to it. Well, that's all we have for this video. That's my basic process for setting up the machine. I, di I did leave off the alignment of the scoring blade, which I'll do in a separate video someday. I hope you find this useful. Feel free to leave some comments on the YouTube page. And see you all later. Bye.